All right, and we are over here. Go ahead and, and take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. We have an introducer here. An introducer here. Woo! You take them out more, get it out. Crows don't get hit by cars because one is always at the side of the road saying, car, car. Please welcome Christian Saucier, who will tell you about the discipline of peace and freedom. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm glad to be here. This is my second year at the, I still don't know the name of this event. Whether it's the Michigan Peace and Liberty Coalition or the Midwest Peace and Liberty Coalition, could you clarify this for me? I, I will help you out with that. Thank you. This is the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest number three, which is organized by the Michigan Peace and Liberty Coalition. I am right. very confused, but enlightened. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, I was at Orkfest recently, just a few uh, weeks ago, and um, I'm French-Canadian, and uh, my parents live in Canada, you know, just a little bit east of Montreal. There was, at Orkfest, a uh, reporter who was there with a the camera crew, there was a lady asking questions, there were two of them from the, it's either the first or the second largest French paper in Canada which, you know, I mean, it, 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 uh, it reaches millions and millions of people. And they were there at Portfest talking about, you know, trying to capture what's going on at Portfest. And when they found out, hey, there's this French-Canadian guy, let's go interview him and see what, uh, you know, what, what he's got to say about freedom or whatever. So, uh, so they catch me up, you know, we sit at a picnic table and we did an interview with the camera looking at me and me sweating under the sun and going like, oh my God, what am I doing? Is this yeah, you know, this is this is like a mainstream newspaper. It's like you know the New York Times kind of thing, but the French Canadian version of. It. And um, so I'm thinking, oh, you know, they're gonna so misrepresent everything. It's gonna be an awful article. And when the article comes out in in uh, online, I saw the online version. The title was called "The Great Migration," and it explains liberty and and freedom and even anarchy. Uh, it's got like a Q and A. It's got an FAQ online. I was like, "Wow, these guys did an amazing job!" And in the article, they quote me like five times. I'm like, "Wow, I'm like a star here." So I'm all excited. I'm all happy. And then, then I get the paper version. The paper version was actually pretty much the same text. So if you read the news article, which I guess few people do nowadays. Nowadays, you just read the, the titles. You're busy in the morning. You know, you read your titles. Okay, I know what's going on in the world. Well, that's what my dad's friends did in Quebec. They read the titles, except the title on the paper was not called The Great Migration, which is kind of a very nice title, you know, libertarians migrating to New Hampshire and all that. The title in the uh, paper version was called Anarchy, Drugs, and Guns. <laughs> and right under that was a picture of me like this at a picnic table at <laughs> Orpheus. <laughs> In bright, big color, on the front page of Appendix A of you know the most well-read you know uh, French Canadian newspaper in, uh, in Canada. So of course, my dad had like you know four or five of his friends just like, uh, is this your son? And in <laughs> Quebec, which is very social, left-leaning kind of thing. Um, I mean, you know, anarchy, guns, and drugs. I mean, they're, they're all bad. Well, drugs, not so bad, but you know, still. So my dad was very, very disappointed, and uh, we had to have a talk about it, and I was, was feeling bad about it, because, you know, I've you know, got my ideas, I'm not going to apologize for my ideas, but I, I don't necessarily want whatever I do to necessarily reflect badly on family and loved ones who might not, you know, agree with, with uh, what I believe in. But, uh, but it, it got me thinking, you know, what, why is it? I mean, my dad and I have talked about, you know, liberty many, many times. To the point where now we don't. You know, it, it's really, really hard for me to convince someone like my father, who has been going through a lifelong belief in a system 
that is, uh, to him, successful, right? My dad is the generation that he worked for one company for like 40 years, and he's got his retirement, you know, that same company's paying his retirement. I mean, he, he's the, uh, the American success story. He's Canadian, but he doesn't even speak English, but that's okay. Uh, so he's the French-Canadian success story, right? Uh, a, a successful career, middle-class man, he bought his house, it's paid for, and, you know, life is great. So to him, what is the problem? Police brutality? Oh, that's in those weird places, I don't know, because it's not here. There's a police brutality, I don't see it. So, you know, there's a bit of the willful ignorance, you know, wanting to just not see, you know, hear no evil and see no evil kind of thing going on. But that is trained, right? That is a lifelong training by our school system, our media, and, and, and the population at large is very well trained, I would say, in, in uh, not acknowledging the discrepancies we just heard about, you know, the 9-11 uh, conspiracies. Yeah, there's a whole lot of questions unanswered. But you go out in the street and you, you ask a, 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 you know, an average person in the street and they'll be like, ah, what, what, whatever, I mean, you know, there's a report, we'll read the report. And, uh, you know, so all of that means that we are facing a population that's been very well trained in believe what they believe in. So what we're going to talk about tonight uh, I'm going to talk to you guys, and, and hopefully we'll make this a little dynamic as well. We're going to talk about what discipline we need in order to bring our message out in the world. So as much as it's, it's taken my dad, you know, my dad's been brainwashed for what, you know, 50, 60 years of his life in believing that government is good and the police is there to protect you and all that. We, most of us here, are working on trying to weaning ourselves out of that mindset. But I'll tell you what, I find myself saying, we America, you know, all the time, right? Oh, we went to Iraq to uh, do this. And we, it's like, I've never been to Iraq, right? But I say we, and I've been, I've considered myself an anarchist now for almost 15 years. And I still find myself saying we, you know, once in a while, because, because it is so deep inside of us. So in order to wean that self, that, 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 that deep-rooted, you know, nasty plant inside of us, I'm not talking about cannabis, cannabis is good, but that, 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 that rotting little thing that's like, you know, spread throughout all of our brains, in order to get rid of that, I believe everyone, and most of us people who, you know, would call themselves libertarian, voluntarists and all that, I believe everyone needs to have a certain level of mental discipline in order to work on ourselves, in order to make ourselves more free and more peaceful. And you know, for us to be able to go out there and, and be examples, I'm not sure about you know, proclaiming and converting and all that, I'm not a big converter kind of guy, I'm not, you're not gonna see me uh, in Times Square talking about, you know, my life was a, you know, a hoax. Uh, but you know, if someone asks me, I'll tell them, I think the whole official story is stupid. Uh, but in order for us to really be the right, the ambassadors of freedom, I think we need to work on ourselves and continuously continue to improve ourselves. And freedom in, and peace, I believe, start right here in our mind. And once you have the right mindset, you can actually you know, go out in the world and be a lot more effective at, um, uh, at promoting, if you will, uh, freedom. So. Uh, this morning, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of where, right here at the, what was it? The Midwest Peace and Liberty Coalition Festival? No, Michigan. Sorry. Right here at the Michigan Peace and Liberty Coalition, this morning, there was uh, Stephanie Murphy. She did a, uh, a yoga class. Who went to that class? One, two, three, four. Wow, we got like four. This is almost half the audience, by the way. Four people on the camera. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, a lot of people went to that class. Was it easy? It's pretty hard. Well, well, it's pretty hard, hard yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. It, it, I got to work on it. It, 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 it yeah. started yeah. mellow from what I heard, but by the end, you were like, oh, wow. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Who, who came to the talk about uh, nonviolent communication? Oh, you guys missed that. Oh, no, one, two, three, four. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right, all right. Here we go. And five, and me, six. Uh, nonviolent communication is, yes, I mean, it's got a murky history. There's a lot of conspiracies around that, too. But uh, as a tool, it's a, it's a great mental tool to live better. And 
Is that easy? No. There's, I, I had to buy the book because I got to go read the book so I understand the tool better because it's not an easy tool to use. So without some level of discipline and training, we're missing out, right? Yoga brings some sort of inner peace into a, a voluntarist that will allow that person to then go out there and face maybe some, some adversity with more serene calm, right? NVC allows someone to be in a, in a conflictual, you know, uh, adversarial conversation and be able to, you know, judo that conversation so that at least the, the, the position of liberty is properly uh, explained to, to, to the other person that might not you know, necessarily believe in liberty. So what I'm explaining, what I'm trying to say is that the, uh, I was playing a song just before we started recording called Freedom Isn't Free. Uh, if you guys have seen the, uh, the movie, it's pretty funny. American, uh, America, World Police. Team America. Team America. Team America. <laughs> and freedom is not free, it's a buck oh five. <laughs> and if you don't have your buck oh five, who's going to pay it for you, you know? Uh, and it, you know, it's a joke. You know, it's a joke song that based on, you know, freedom requires the lives of our soldiers to go fight for us overseas so that the combat doesn't come here. Well, that's bullshit. Uh, you know, other people say, oh, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Who's that? Jefferson or... One of the founding dudes. Uh, I think that's bullshit too, right? I mean, oh, I'm very vigilant right now, and you know, guess what? You know, doesn't do anything. Uh, to me, when I say freedom is not free, is that your inner peace, your inner freedom, and we're going to talk about you know some some what, what that means. But your inner freedom, you're not born with it. When we're born, you know, as animals, and we get raised and usually propagandized by uh, by by the powerful and all that, but you know, by the end of your you know growing years, uh, most likely, I mean, there, there's a number of kids here who are probably going to be well way better off than I was when I was their age. But you know, by the end of your career or your your, your growing years, uh, you're probably not very free. You're probably traumatized about a bunch of stuff. You're probably confused about the news that makes no sense. And in order to get through this, I believe we're going to have an M. Uh, Trivium conversation after uh, after my talk here, so that's going to be interesting too. Uh, but in order to get through this, you have to have tools, you have to have certain disciplines in order to uh, well remain sane. To be honest, right? I mean, once you know some of the things that you know we believe in, it's really maddening to see you know a cop kill, you know, strangle, not kill, strangle, physically strangle a guy to death in Manhattan. I mean, what's up with that? It's, it's, I mean, you know, or shoot some other guy in the Walmart because he's carrying a toy gun in a Walmart. I mean, they sell the gun at Walmart, you know? <laughs> so, you know, there's a price tag on it. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's really maddening, and unless you have the right tools, you're going to be very angry. You're going to be very upset. You're going to be living your days with, like, you know, opening up your Facebook or your, what's, what's a good news aggregation site nowadays? Oh, I don't watch the news on the internet anymore. It's so sad. But anyway, you're going to bring up your, your, your news thing, and you're just going to go like, oh, I hate the world. And you're going to go to work, and you're going to do this, you know. And, and you know, that's not being free, right? You are now an en enslaved to yourself in a certain way, because in your own mind, now you're just, you just lost um, the beauty that, that we see here, right? I, I, this is my second year here. I come here, and I'm like, I feel free here, right? And, and because it's so hard to get this feeling in this sense when I'm back home in front of my computer, driving to work or doing my thing and being stuck with the real world out there that is not so green and not so pretty and full of violence and, and, and bad things. So, without further ado, we're going to talk about um, some of the ways that we can hopefully uh, foster some of that mental peace and mental freedom. And I'm going to start with peace. Uh, I think peace and liberty are, are very, very uh, related. You know, uh, they say war is the health of the state, and, and I, I, I really believe that. Uh, you look at, at, at everything the state does, and it seems like their number one thing is sowing fear and generating wars. That's, that seems to be above social security and building roads. Uh, war is, is really the big thing. So, uh, if war is the health of the state, I believe the opposite side of that is that liberty is the foundation of freedom. You cannot have a free society 
unless you have a peaceful society, and I think vice versa, right? So maybe there's a catch-22 there where you need to figure out how to, to enter it at that. Yeah, it's not a vicious circle. What would it be? It would be a, a, a virtuous cycle. I like it. Thank you, Diana. So, you know, the, uh, the, the idea is that, you know, for, for freedom to foster and grow, you need, you need some level of peace. If, if a society is at war, or if you're at war with yourself in your own head, you will not get that freedom that, that, that you're looking for. So, so peace is really something that needs to be uh, developed. And I think the first place to start is right here. It's peace of mind. The idea that even if I read a piece of article in the newspaper that talks about yet another cop killing yet another you know, black or white or whatever guy or gal out there for seemingly no reason, uh, you know, right there, that moment, my heart goes like, oh! and you need a certain level of mental judo, discipline, jujitsu, whatever it is, in order to be able to catch that and not let that influence the rest of your days. And the difference, what happens, and I'm not saying you don't do anything about it, but by actually catching it and framing it and putting it in its box, which means you know, there might be some to-dos related to the fact that you know, the police are killing people maybe in your neighborhood, right? So you can wear a cop block badge. I walk around with my badge and at least every week, I don't cop block myself and by myself in my little town, so doesn't really uh, work so well over there, but but I get the word out though. People are asking about it all the time, and you know I feel this you know, with, with my current situation in life right now where I'm at. That's that's what I can do for cop block. It's send them send them a couple of you know little bits <laughs> once in a while, and I can wear their badge proudly and, and actually talk to people about it. And and so while I do get angry at reading the news. I try to catch that anger, put it in its, a, a container where you know, it's not gonna spill over the rest of my day, ruin everything so that I go on you know, without thinking you know, and being upset all the time. So I try not to do that and, and do things that are positive for my own personal peace and therefore my own personal liberty. And I'll tell you what, it's been, uh, it's been about two years that I've been kind of practicing some of these mental exercise, we're going to talk about a few of them, uh, and, and it's made a huge difference. I mentioned I was you know, around for 15 years as I consider myself an anarchist. Well, it, th most of those 15 years, I was frustrated and I was debating with everybody and it wasn't working out so well. Now I'm actually pretty much at peace. I don't try to convert everybody. If you've got some questions, you know, come over, we'll talk. But a lot of it, I feel so much more free in my life today that I was even just a couple of years ago. Um, what I would say is, you know, maybe in closing this, this, this little peace paragraph, uh, figure out what is your peace, right? There's, there's a million different ways to get to mental um, clarity and mental uh, peacefulness. You figure out what is yours. It could be religion, it could be prayer, it could be meditation, it could be yoga. It could be nonviolent communication. It, I mean, there's a million different paths. And um, it is important that in your life, in order to get to that peaceful state of mind, you, 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 you figure that out. And I've used a mix of stuff. You make your own mix of stuff. And, and, and that's going to, I think, make a big difference in, uh, in how you perceive the world around you and the peace inside your heart. Any, uh, any thoughts or comments so far about this? Does this resonate with anybody's experience? I hear some head nodding. Uh, were, you, were you born with this inner peace, or did you have to work at it? Oh, I... Uh, I mean, I yeah, you have to work at it, in my opinion, but like, I mean, it's, oh, I was just, I kind of said to her a minute ago that like, between, I, I don't know where I heard it, but somewhere I heard it's, it, not my statement, it's a famous statement from someone. Famous. You're going to sound great anyway. Yeah, it's, it's between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space is freedom. Oh, yes, very nice. And that's kind of how I feel. Like, yeah. like being rogue, being like living with what some call anarchy in my life, that's my piece. Knowing that I'm, have you ever seen The Prisoner? I have Patrick McEwen? Oh, yes. Awesome. 
Yeah, like it's it's so it's about it's it's about what goes on up here and your attitude. And as long as you yeah. can project yourselves in the right ways to yourself and to others, then you know that's for you. If, if I can explain maybe the stimulus response there for like half a second, and maybe we, you and I talk about it you know, some more at eight o'clock, and while the microphone passes down to Diana, the stimulus and response comment I think is is, is right on par. Right, uh, we are trained to. Ooh, aggression, you know, sub subservient, right? When the cop shows up behind you, stop, put your both hands on the wheel, bow your head, look very nice, smile at the officer. I mean, all of these things happen without anybody thinking, right? They're not thinking. It's like stimulus, ooh, he's got a badge. Yes, sir, I'm at the airport. Go, raise your hands. Yes, sir. And, and, and you do everything they do almost like instantly, you know, inst yeah, without thinking, <laughs> and and that freedom, the freedom that you, know, you were talking about, is what happens between the stimulus and the response. If you're so well trained that there's no thought that enters between the two, then someone claps their hand. It's just like my dog that's running around over there. When I say sit, well, she doesn't always respond, but you know, hopefully she does, right? And she's not thinking. She's just like, oh, that's Daddy, sit. And, and whereas when you have space in there where you can actually think, what am I doing at this airport and this guy is wanting to frisk me or walking to some machine, maybe I say, no, okay, can we do something different, right? You start thinking, if it's not an automated behavior, then you have freedom in between. And that's where you think about, what am I, how, I, how do I choose to react in this circumstance? Of course, if you want to get on a plane, you're going to have to submit in some way but you can still think about how you decide to submit so that, you know, in a way that's least harmful to you, I guess, so that you can actually get your objective done, but at least you're not just like stimulus response. Yeah. And that's, that's very good. Diana, did you have something to Yeah, um, I, I actually think we are born free. Um, I think that we're born free. In terms of like our interface and that type of thing, I mean, I think that we're, we're, kind of, we're I think we're born to that, but as you know, as we're infants and we grow into toddlers and that type of thing, we start to discover that the world does not always meet our needs, and you know the way that we want that to happen, and I think that's kind of what creates the initial, you know, lack of inner peace that that we start to have as you know children and everything. And I also do think I agree with what you said about how we're, we end up being trained by our parents and by schools and by society as a whole um, how to behave properly. And, um, and that may go against our, our, you know, our, I guess our better instincts. And in that respect, you know, we're definitely, I, I mean, I feel as a child, I became unfree pretty quickly. Like I remember, I remember it. And, um, but initially I do think we're, I think we're born to be free. Like I think so I, yeah. I, I would, I, what I would agree there is that, yeah, I think there's a natural voice tendency. There's a little angel in my show. I don't know what it is, right? There's something in us that says, I can't tolerate this. I, I want out kind of thing, right? So I think that that is a natural uh, behavior. However, I guess what I'm trying to say with, with this talk about peace and, and discipline, that doesn't come for free. You know, you, you're going to have to work at it. Uh, this is not a, I mean, so, so for me to be here talking to you guys, I mean, when I was raised, I was raised learning French. So my first language is French. And now I speak English, you know, good enough that we can talk, communicate, and, and actually exchange ideas. If I had not gone through the pain of learning English, which is, you know, not easy when you learn French uh, as, a, as a baby, then I would not have the freedom and the liberty to be with you here today and talking about whatever we're talking about, right? So there, there, there was a requirement of some effort being put on my part to actually learn the language that most of the planet, that's not true, but you know, most of the planet around where I was born you know, speaks so that I can have more liberty and more freedom in my life and come work in the United States or you know, whatever instead of just being confined to, to Quebec. So I think while, while the, the natural instinct is, is a valid argument, you know, we humans want to be free and express themselves and all that, I think there still is a need for discipline and, and, uh, and uh, 
this discipline is such a harsh word, that's why I picked it. I, I liked it. I, I thought like freedom and discipline kind of conflict a little bit. But I don't think they do, right? It requires discipline and hard work and some level of effort for us to learn the tools that we need in order to truly be as free as we can be. And and you know, don't necessarily say as free as we can be. I mean, we still live within a society that will not allow us to be as free as we might imagine us to be, want to be. But, but still, within this society, there's a whole lot more space between you know, the initiation of a stimuli and response. There's a whole lot of space you can build in there so that in your mind, you can build that mental freedom. So now we're going to talk about a couple of exercises that I do. A uh, question. Yes. I was gonna say that like I, there's a documentary called On Grip by a guy named Ben Stewart where they interview someone in Canada who lives in America. And he's, he talks about freedom and whatnot. And he said one of the first things he did was look up slavery. And in the definition that he found in some black law dictionary or something to explain dependency. So like you are know, slave to a drug or a yeah. addiction or all kinds yeah. of and I think that's the interesting part about when we're born, is we're born so dependent. We're born unable to do certain things for ourselves, so you're like, you're sort of born into a dictatorship. And so like, you, have, you grow out of it, but the part that I think is so interesting is that like, in the beginning you don't necessarily need it, because you actually need the opposite, you need nurture. You know, not big brother, but dad and mom. And so then you got, you grow up and you get to a point where you're supposed to become interdependent and you're supposed to be able to, you know, rely on yourself and they do everything they can to remove that from you, right? To make the father figure thing, all that. Big brother. Yeah. Great thoughts. There's a, uh, there's a good book, you reminded me of that book called uh, uh, Renegade's History of America by a guy called Thaddeus Russell. He, uh, he's a historian, but not, not, not your typical historian. And uh, his approach to uh, history is that a lot of what we uh, benefit from today, a lot of the freedoms that we have here in America today, um, don't come from government grants or you know, government saving the day or whatever, right? or corporations providing us with all this you know, great stuff we've got around us. No, he says it's been always throughout history a bunch of renegades and outcasts and, and prostitutes and slaves and all the bad people who have, through their behavior throughout history, actually moved the needle slightly you know, to the right direction so that today we can you know, drink alcohol and talk relatively freely and whatever. But in that book, you know, that's, that's not even the point. In that book, there's two chapters that are very relevant to what we're talking about here today. One is called The Freedom of Slavery and the other one, the next chapter right after, is called The Slavery of Freedom. And in those two chapters, in the first chapter, The Freedom of Slavery, he, he looks at the life of a chattel slave, a slave, slave, the life of a chattel slave, you know, a black guy or gal, you know, 200 years ago in a plantation in South Carolina. What's their life, right? And, and these slaves have no control over their physical lives. I mean, they are either chained or they're, you know, kept within a, uh, you know, a, a, a property, I guess. And if they try to exit, they're going to be shut down like an animal. And I mean, you know, their body, I mean, they control it, I guess, through their neurons and, 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 and neural system. But, but their body is not theirs, right? There's someone else that owns their physical body. And so they work all day in the field and it sucks. And obviously, it's, it doesn't suck. It's, it's, it's awful. But, uh, but at night, at night, at night they go home in whatever little shack that the you know, landlord or whatever master is giving them. And over there they talk amongst each other, right? Over there they dance with one another. Over there they, 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 they play music with each other. They make love with one another. Over there at night, the life of a slave was more free than the life of the free guy in his big house. And that's the, you know, kind of the point of those two chapters. The slave, while physically shackled and unable to attain any sort of physical comfort below what the master would give them, was mentally very 
three. I mean, you know, there, there, there was no, I mean, many of them obviously were, were just like mentally destroyed, meaning like I'm just going to submit and then whatever, right? But a lot of them were just like, well, you know, screw this. I mean, yeah, this, I mean, this is my lot. There's nothing I can do, obviously, about this. They're going to kill me if I try to run away. So I, I'm just going to, you know, mentally be happy as, as happy as I can be. And, and, and that culture has pervaded our, our history, and that's what the book is about, you know, up to this day, you know, our, our expressions, our music, our dances, I mean, a whole lot of who we are today as even a white, not even American, French Canadian, it comes from black American slaves 200 years ago. And in the next chapter, he talks about the slavery of freedom, where uh, he talks about, you know, the guy who, who, who owns the property, right? I control this land, it is mine, I get good water to drink, I have good food, I have my wife, I have my kids, my society is in control and in order, and I love it. But you always have to behave like this, you have to get up like that, you have to do this like this, the woman have to curtsy like this, and, and this puritanical, very regimented life of quote-unquote free people while they have physical freedom to go down downtown, to go, you know, whatever, buy something at the store and come back or whatever, their minds were in a very real way enslaved by the societal order, right? You have to do this. It would not be acceptable for me today to do this presentation in front of you with my pants down. It would look stupid and it's just not acceptable. We've been trained that, hey, look, when there's a guy on stage, unless it's a very specific place, he should have his pants on. <laughs> and, and, and so there's all sorts of things that we just, you know, they're just, you know, that, well, this is, this is normal. In fact, if, it's, if something is different than this, I, I, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And, and the life of a rich plantation owner slash, you know, person, you know, back in the, you know, 17, 1800s was mentally very, very regimental. I mean, to a very real extent, the life of my dad right now is still very regimented because now it's now it's the CNN and you feel more free physically, but you're still very, very docile, you know, mentally. So the difference between physical and mental freedom is 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 very real. Chattel slaves have impacted society to this day, you know, with their mental freedom. And today, of course, we have kind of a balance between the two, right? Our, our, our social rules are not as strict as they used to be, you know, a couple hundred years ago. Our physical, you know, behavior, including, thank God, you know, uh, people of darker, different skin color, just, you know, uh, are, are a lot more free than they were with the child slaves. So, so there's been a balance kind of that's been reached, but that balance is still not good enough, right? We still have, you know, a lot of depression, a lot of you know, people freaking out. I'm freaking out all the time. So, so we still have a lot of room to grow where we can bring more freedom in our lives by opening this, that space between you know, me reading a news article and reacting like, oh, the police again, right? In between there is my freedom where I decide how I want to react to this. And the black slaves of a few hundred years ago if you read Thaddeus Russell's you know, uh, history, uh, Renegade History of America, these black slaves had figured out how to expand that mental freedom because they had nothing else. And so today I think we can benefit from a lot of that. All right, one more thought. Yes? I really, I really like catchphrases. And you made me think of, I heard, I heard it said, the difference between physical slavery and financial slavery is that with physical slavery they had to house and clothe and feed the slaves. With financial slavery, we house and clothe and feed ourselves, ourselves, which yeah. honestly makes it easier for them. I, I'll tell you what, I just sold a house recently. Uh, a mortgage is very much a very real chain that you got around your ankle or your arms or whatever. And I feel so free now that I am not owing to these banks who want to know everything about yourself. No, I, I totally hear what you said there. Uh, all right, so some tools. You know, let's talk about something real here. Uh, I got a couple of exercises that uh, I wish I did more of them myself, but I read a lot about it. Oh, <laughs> trivium. <laughs> we were talking about the trivium earlier. You know, quickly for those who don't know, trivium is that you know you, you know of stuff, right? There's a whole lot of, of of things that you might be aware of, 
Well, until you put your head to it and actually think and make logical connections between these things, it's just huh, trivia, right? We call it trivia nowadays. If you're really good at Jeopardy, uh, it's not that you, you're really wise and smart. No, it's just that you remember a whole lot of stuff. And, and that stuff, while that's nice if you go on Jeopardy, it's not really useful in your day-to-day -day life because you haven't applied logic and brain power to it. You just stored it somewhere in your magical brain that can remember a million things. That <laughs> mine, mine certainly can't. But um, so the logic part of the trivium is where you think about these facts, you try to make you know, links between them, and you're like, oh, this is how that works, right? And then the last part is doing something about it. So I've done a lot of logic in my life, so I've been sitting on my butt you know, for, you know, I was an anarchist for 15 years until two years ago, you know, Diana and I are at a conference, and this guy actually looks up at me and says, yeah, but what have you done about it? Like, well, um, say, oh, you're a wannabe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. talk about nonviolent communication. Right? All these, you know, my, my emotions are boiling. I'm like, who the hell are you to tell me I'm a wannabe, right? I'm in the only one born when I'm not, like whatever. So, so I'm all upset and I'm thinking about it and I'm like, well, it's kind of right. What am I doing about it? So over the last couple of years, I said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to start talking in places like this. I'm going to start, you know, hopefully being more of an example for my friends, families, and, and surroundings to show what freedom really can be. And some of the tricks that I've actually tried to apply in my life. So, you know, see, see if they work for you. The first one is journaling, writing down stuff. Uh, not that there's anything, or maybe there is, magical about writing down something, but if you take 30 minutes every day, or 20 or 15, whatever works for you, right? Morning, evening, doesn't matter. 30 minutes, we'll start with that, uh, where you sit down in front of a piece of paper, your little journal, and you can have a little key if you want, uh, that, where, where, where you write down, you know, hey, uh, what happened today? What's the best thing that happened to me today? And what's maybe the worst thing, right? You know, go for extremes, things that are easy to, to, to remember. And just the act of writing down either your emotions, your thoughts, uh, your complaint, your, 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 your vent to yourself, whatever, right? Don't put it on Facebook, this is not on a computer. Writing it down on a piece of paper makes a big difference. Magic. Uh, but, but you do that and it forces a certain level of introspection. And, of course, you do it once, you're not going to get much benefit from it. Uh, you do it once a day for a week, meh, for a month, oh, for six months, you will be a different person. I guarantee you that you do this for six months. Three months, where you write down 20 minutes, 15 minutes a day, a day, write down the best thing, the worst thing, and you will learn a lot about yourself. You'll know what, you know, push, where, where are your buttons, you'll know so that when someone pushes that button, you don't have just a stimulus response reaction, but you're like, oh, uh -huh. clearly I've mentioned it like, what, three, four times, police brutality is one of my buttons, and, and now I can actually say like, ah, oh, you're, you're just trying to, to, to round me up, right? So, but by, by knowing more of yourself, you would actually be much more in control. That will bring a level of peace and freedom in your mind that uh, if you don't have it already, you, you, you will cherish for the rest of, uh, of your life, hopefully. Uh, document your success, successes as well, right? When, 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 when things change over time in your life, it's very nice to write that down so that when you feel depressed, you know, a year from now, and you're like, oh man, nothing's working out. You've got something to look back and say, like, oh wow, I did do that. Yeah, that was pretty good. Oh yeah, I remember that, that was fun. So having that journal, having that place where you can actually log parts of yourself, I think it, it is very, very powerful. Um, always do your best. That's a hard one, right? I'm lazy, I, I didn't prepare very well for this talk. So guess what? I was nervous before the talk, right? I'm like, oh man, I meant to do this. And so I did not do my best work for this, sorry. Uh, but but I would, you know, had I done it, regardless of the outcome, I'd be like, hey, I, this was me. I did my best, right? And again, with, with that mental attitude comes a level of detachment from the judgment that other people are going to give you, right? And when you're slaved, or enslaved, I guess, to the judgment of others, then your life becomes a series of worry about, oh my God, am I going to do well, and this is going to be good, I don't know, I don't want to be upset, I'm not going to do it. No, 
fuck it, right? And just, just be you, forget about the judgment, or figure out a trick to, to push it out a little bit so that you can actually dare do and be who you are. And if that's not freedom, I mean, I don't know what it is, right? So I feel a lot more free since I've gotten rid of my stage fright so that now I can come here and just like lever, you know, with you guys, you know, for like an hour about, about stuff. And, and, and that makes me feel happy. So I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are having, having fun, but I am. So that, that, that's important for my freedom. And, and, and whatever it is in your life that, that, that you want to do that you might be afraid to do right now, uh, go at it and just do your best. You might not be good at it, but that's okay. If you do your best, you're not going to feel bad about it. And you're going to fail, you're going to fail again, you're going to fail again. Oh, and then you're going to succeed and you're going to be real free and happy at that point. Uh, compassion, cultivate compassion. So my dad, he thinks he's free. I don't think he's very free. He's upset at me because I was in a paper with the word anarchy over my head or something and drugs and whatever. And, and, and all of that, I mean, you know, when, when, when he wrote to me saying like, son, you know, I'm proud of you, but when I see things like this, I just can't understand you, right? He was, he was really disappointed and upset at me. And my reaction initially, I, I caught it, I had enough mental space there between the, the, the stimulus and, and, and the reaction. I was like, oh, Christian, I was upset. I'm like, oh, who the, you know, and I'm like, no, no, Christian, calm down, right? It, this is this is this is who he is. This is what he knows. He you know he's not spent the last whatever fifteen years of you know you know of his life being a wannabe like I am. You know learning about you know Mises and Rothbard and all the crap that I know in my head that I've never done anything about it. But but at least it's in my head, right? Well, he doesn't even have that. So how can I be upset at him, right? And being mad at someone else because they don't know any better, right? Being mad at the, the the, the gal at the post office, or even being mad at the stupid police officer who's writing you up for a ticket. Right? I mean, these guys don't, just don't even know this is all they know. Right? So there's a, there's a big important space there. If you want to broaden that mind space, it's called compassion. And that guy might be torturing you right now, he might be citing you, he might be laughing at you, kicking at you, disappointing you, or you might be disappointing him like my dad. And if you can find and work out a way to build compassion, there's plenty of books out there, Dalai Lama, you know, there's all sorts of stuff you can figure out how to, to build up compassion. But understand that the other person, they, they do what they know, they do what they can. And what they do to you in their interactions to you is not a personal thing. You know, my, my, my dad, uh, as personal as that relationship is, he, he's not personally upset at me. He might think he is, but he's not. He's a set of uh, this mental construct he calls Christian in his head. That's my name. And, uh, and, and, you know, he's like, wow, this newspaper article does not fit with this Christian I have in my head. Well, yeah, it doesn't because, you know, him and I have a hard time talking about this. And, and instead of getting upset at my dad, I just, you know, don't talk to him about, you know, these things. So, so he's got a very, very different Christian in his mind than the guy talking to you guys today. So that's okay. It's okay. I mean, it's not ideal. I wish it was different. But given that you know, communication with someone like this takes time, uh, I, I'm going to take all the time it takes. And, 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 and it's okay if right now we don't have you know, a perfect relationship there. So that compassion comes in there where you can be a lot more tolerant with other people around you who might be even like shouting in your face how bad you are because of your beliefs. Understand that. That, that's their own beliefs, it's not you. And um, maybe uh, maybe one last thing, and that, that's gonna be a little cliche, but I'm gonna end with this. Uh, it's right now, it's this moment. It, 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 you know, the Carpe Diem, right? Maybe, maybe this audience is a little too loud or too young. What, what was the movie from the 80s? Uh, Dead, oh, Poet oh, Dead Poet yeah, Society. Dead Poet Society, yeah. Uh, you know, seize the moment. Right here, There's, th this is never going to happen again, right? It's happening now, and in five minutes, it's over. And and while I'm thinking maybe about tomorrow, oh, I'm going to start driving home tomorrow. Oh man, then I'm going to be 
at work, and, and you know, we spend our lives and our heads worrying about the future, worrying about other stuff we can't even control, like whether Hillary Clinton's going to be elected. Oh my God, that'd be awful. Oh my God, I, I got to start an anti-Hillary campaign. No, I can't even influence that. I and mean, this is going to happen with or without me. Yeah. You live your life moment by moment. This moment right here, who, who are you? Are, is this a dream? Is it, no, it doesn't look like a dream. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in this place called Circle, Circle Lines. What, what a magical moment, right? Live every moment, and that is living free. It is living peacefully, and as long as you're able to keep that consciousness anchored in a moment. And by the way, that's really hard. That's why it requires some discipline. I'm still working on it. You don't need to go on top of the Himalayas. You don't need to go hide in a cave to, to meditate deeply. No, 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 no. The best place to learn about freedom and liberty is right here, right now. And do that. Try to practice this. Try to remind yourself multiple times throughout the day, hey, what am I doing? This is pretty amazing. Whatever it is you're doing, even if it's that, you know, it might, it's a unique moment and you need to you know, figure out how to savor it. And, um, well, I'm still working on all that. <laughs> but I've been working pretty hard on it in the last couple of years and it's made a huge difference. I am much more peaceful, much more happier. That's bad English. Much, um, uh, much more free, you know, essentially. And, uh, and I, I savor and enjoy it uh, more and more every day. So, you should try to do the same too. Questions, thoughts? You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no. All right, thank you everyone.